What's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at something a little special. Now this is brand new from Intel and it's known as the Intel NUC 13 Extreme. Over the past few years, Intel has put out some very powerful mini PCs from their Intel NUC business line up to the Extreme line. But you know, when it comes to the new 13th gen Extreme, this definitely takes the cake given that it's powered by Intel's brand new 13th gen line of CPUs. And you can actually pick this up in three different variants. You can go with the i5 version, which is powered by the 13600K, the i7 version with the 13700K, or you could go with their i9-13900K variant, and that's exactly what we're going to be taking a look at in this video. I mean, it is an absolute monster. We've got 24 cores, 32 threads, and a max turbo up to 5.8 gigahertz in a very small form factor PC. And oh yeah, by the way, the 13th Gen Extreme NUC supports a three-slot full-size desktop GPU, and we just happen to have the RTX 3080 Ti in this one here. Obviously, this is coming in much larger than any other NUC that they've ever created, but for good reason. I mean, they needed room for that GPU and plenty of cooling, and I can tell you right now the cooling system in this is one of the best when it comes to these NUCs. But I wanted to give you a quick comparison here because, uh, you know, in terms of desktop gaming PCs, this is still a very small form factor unit. So on the left hand side, I've got my main gaming PC, which just happens to be powered by a 13900K. And by the way, it's just a mid tower case. It's not even a full size gaming case. And uh, on the far right, we've got the newest, smallest NUC that they make, Wall Street Canyon. This is more of a business NUC. But yeah, right in the middle there, we've got the Nook 13 Extreme, and they've definitely packed a lot of power into this small form factor unit. And to do this, they came up with an ingenious design focused around their new 13th gen compute element. Now, some of you who are familiar with these NUCs might be familiar with the compute elements. We've seen them from the 11th gen up to the 12th gen extreme NUCs. But with this new compute element, it's been totally redesigned to accommodate a larger cooler, given that we're pumping a lot more wattage into these 13th gen Intel CPUs. And now the PCIe slot is actually facing down. And by the way, this is a Gen 5 slot. And as you can see, this RTX 3080 fits right in here. Now, taking a closer look at the new compute element, you can see that they're still using the blower style cooler that they used on their old compute elements. But now we've got this offset cooler on the left hand side. So we've got a lot more surface area to keep these CPUs nice and chilly. And this is still fully modular. We could go ahead and pull out this compute element if we wanted to. We've also got three M.2 SSD slots in this unit. It uses Gen 4 SSDs. And they're still utilizing SODIMM RAM here, but it is DDR5 with the new 13th gen. I really wish they would have upgraded to full-size RAM just to keep that price down and the speed up. But I completely understand what they were trying to do here. They needed to save as much space as they could. And another new addition to this Nook line here is the use of an SFX power supply. We've actually got a 750 watt gold power supply in here. And around back, we've got enough space for some 2.5 inch SSDs if you want to add those. But keep in mind, we've got three M.2 NVMe SSD slots in here, so we can add plenty of storage to this new Nook. So like I mentioned, they've packed a lot into this Intel NUC 13 Extreme. And this one happens to be known as the NUC 13 R9 GI9. The i9 obviously stands for the i9 13900K CPU we have here. 24 cores, 32 threads, 8 performance cores up to 5.8 gigahertz, and 16 efficiency cores up to 4.3. This thing really does put down some amazing performance. This supports dual channel DDR5 up to 64 gigabytes, but remember it is SODIMM RAM. I've got 32 gigabytes of Kingston Fury running at 4800 megahertz in this unit. We've also got three M.2 key M slots for NVMe SSDs. It does support Gen 4 SSDs, and I've got a one terabyte Kingston Fury Gen 4 NVMe SSD in this unit. It's got Wi-Fi 6E using the AX1690i chip and Bluetooth 5.2. For a little faster connectivity, around back we've got a 2.5 gigabit ethernet port and a 10 gigabit ethernet port standard. So yeah, that's really awesome to see that on a unit like this. And when it comes to GPU support, this has a PCIe X16 Gen 5 slot. It will support a three slot card up to 450 watts, given that we have that 750 watt power supply in here. And by the way, we've got three 8 pin PCIe connectors in here, just in case you get a card that utilizes those three connectors. But with this, I've got the ASUS TUF RTX 3080 Ti. 
Okay, so I've had the system up and running for a little while now. We're on Windows 11 Pro, and overall, I mean, we've got more than enough power for anything. If you wanted to use this as your everyday desktop, you're not going to have an issue with it whatsoever. 4K video editing, photo editing, even 3D modeling would work out really well, especially given that we have that 3080 Ti. I mean, it's handled everything that I've thrown at it, and it hasn't even broken a sweat. But first and foremost, this is a gaming machine, and we'll get into that in a second. But I did want to show you the Nook Studio software here. It's a little revamp for this one here since we don't have any skull logos on the unit itself, but we've got full control over the CPU power and fan speeds. We've also got a few settings here, low power, balanced, max performance. You can go with the custom fan curve if you want to, and all of this is also adjustable from the BIOS with a little more like that turbo time. We can actually take it up to 128 from the BIOS, but I just left it where it was. But for the limited amount of LEDs we do have up top, we've got full control over those also from the studio software. Uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely works out well if you just kind of want to do a one-click setup with this unit. But for everything we're going to be testing in this video, we're in performance mode, and we've also got the fan curve set to cool. Now, the first thing I wanted to take a look at were a few benchmarks that I ran on this unit. And first up, we've got Geekbench 5, coming in with a single core of 2087 Multi 22294. This i9-13900K is an excellent performer when it comes to single and multi-core, as you can see from this synthetic. Next up, we've got Cinebench R23, and we get a total multi-core score of 28,987. And this is actually getting really close to my water-cooled setup with the same CPU. Little less given the CPU temps got up to 94 degrees Celsius here. But keep in mind, we do have a fan curve that we can fully adjust, so if you don't mind a little more noise, you could get more out of this but I just left it at that cool preset and it seems to do a really good job. Moving over to some GPU benchmarks with 3 d Mark Firestrike, total score here 37,165, and finally Time Spy with the 19,105. So just judging by these synthetic benchmarks on the CPU and the GPU, this thing is performing absolutely amazingly, but now it's time to get into some real world gaming. And first up, we've got Spider-Man Remastered. 4K, very high, no DLSS, and I want to show you this here. Very high, no scaling, no DLSS. This is just raw 4K performance out of this 1080 and the 13900K. And uh, we can get an average of around 89 FPS out of this game. I've personally just had much better luck with NVIDIA cards in this game here, and keep in mind, with DLSS on at 4K, it really depends on the setting, you could go ahead and lock this at 120 FPS. Next up, we've got Cyberpunk 2077, and I wanted to show this running with ray tracing on and off. With ray tracing set to ultra at 4K, I did turn VSync on because I get a lot of frame tear. But as you can see with that ray tracing ultra preset, we get a pretty steady 60 FPS. It does dip down to around 59 every once in a while, but that's something you'd never notice without a frame counter on. And I know some people aren't really into ray tracing, so I wanted to test it without. So here it is at 4K high with no DLSS. No ray tracing on right now, and we can get an average of around 84 FPS out of it. But unfortunately, at ultra settings with no DLSS, we do get some dips under 60. So instead of just adjusting individual settings, I took it down to high just on that preset, and it still looks awesome. Moving over to God of War. 4K Ultra, no DLSS, we can get an average of around 72 FPS. I thought we'd get a little more with no DLSS, but you know, keep in mind we've still got that setting to mess around with if you need more out of it. Personally, I don't mind locking these games down at 60 4K, they still look great and play amazingly. And just because we're here, I figured I'd turn DLSS to balanced and show you what happens here jumps up to an average of over 100, and to tell you the truth, to my eye, at least on the monitors that I have, image quality, to me, looks the same with DLSS set to balanced versus no DLSS, so, I mean, it's really up to you in the end, but this game is fully playable. I always have to throw in one of my favorite games here, and I knew we weren't going to have an issue running this. Skyrim 4K Ultra with some reshade mods on. Um, we could probably max this out even more with more mods and still get a steady 60 out of it. Here's The Witcher 3, 4K Ultra, and I even left Hairworks on. I usually turn it off, but with the 3080 Ti, there's no need to turn it off. We're getting an average over 100 FPS out of this game, totally maxed out. Seven 
And the final one I wanted to test here was Modern Warfare 2. 4K Ultra with DLSS set to quality. Even on the 3080 Ti, we do get some major dips with DLSS off at Ultra. You could run this with just high settings and no DLSS, but I still think it looks great here with the quality preset. And I also ran the built-in benchmark. With this, we averaged 114 FPS. And just tweaking a few settings here, it really depends on how low you want to go or how much DLSS you want to use. We could do 120 or 144 with this. It just really depends on what kind of settings we use. And of course, I wanted to test out a little bit of emulation. Now, I mean, when it comes down to it, this thing is going to run any emulator. You want to do Switch at 4K, you want to do Wii, Wii U, GameCube at 4K or even 5K resolution. More than enough power out of this 13900K and the 3080 Ti, so I figured I'd just throw some harder to emulate games at it. And first up, we've got Xbox 360 using Xenia, Red Dead running at a constant 60, and finally, PS3 with Skate 3, 4K, Vulcan back in. This is going to handle it. If there's a real interest, I can do a full emulation video, but I'm going to tell you right now, it will max out anything that's on the market right now. As long as the emulator's a decent emulator, it's going to run it at full speed, 4K and over. Another thing I always like to test with these smaller form factor PCs is total system power consumption from the wall. So while I'm doing my testing, I have this plugged into a kilowatt meter. And this is not going to be a low power consumption PC by any means, given the parts we're using here. But at idle, we're around 77 watts, which is a bit higher than I thought it would be. But we're in performance mode, so if you set this to balanced, we could get less at idle. Average 4K gaming jumps up to around 480 watts, and that's at 4K. 1080, 1440 will be lower, and the maximum that I could get this to pull from the wall will max it out the CPU and the GPU with 658 watts. And remember, we've got a 750 watt gold rated power supply here, so we're under that limit, but this is not a low power consumption PC, and going into this, I didn't expect it. Another thing I always like to monitor with these smaller PCs are CPU temps, and this did much better than I thought it was gonna. But we do have that newly redesigned cooler for the 13th compute element, and uh, at idle, we're around 39 degrees Celsius, average 4K gaming, 78, and the maximum that I got this to hit was 96 degrees Celsius. And when it comes to fan noise, it really depends on how hot you want the CPU to run. So you can set it up so it's really loud and it keep it nice and cool. You'll never see those kind of temps that we just saw there. Or you could set it up so the whole unit's a lot quieter, but it will get a bit hotter. I mean, it really depends on what you're looking for. With all of these fans set to 100%, I mean, this thing can definitely get loud. But under everyday normal use, web browsing, 4K video playback, you're not going to hear this thing. At idle, I mean, it's almost dead silent. But as soon as you put a load on that CPU, it can ramp up a bit. So yeah, in the end, we definitely have the most powerful Intel NUC that they've ever created, and it really comes down to the fact that we can add that triple slot GPU, and we've got up to the i9-13900K. To tell you the truth, the i9 might be overkill for a lot of people, and the i5 would be sufficient. And if you went with the i5 configuration, it'd stay cooler, it'd be quieter, and it'd pull a lot less energy from the wall. And you'd still get absolutely amazing gaming performance, depending on what GPU you pair it up with. But that's going to wrap it up for this video. Really appreciate you watching. Let me know what you think about this thing in the comments below. It's going to come in a lot more expensive than something you could build with kind of the same specs. But, you know, we're really paying for the form factor here and that compute element. Keeping everything super small does cost a bit more in 2022. But this thing performs really, really well. If there's anything else you want to see running on this, let me know in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more or maybe picking one up, I'll leave some links in the description. But that's it for this one. And like always, thanks for watching.